Let us take 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34 and 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Now 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. The question of whether a woman can preach the word of God has been the subject of much debate over the centuries. Some lean on these verses of scripture to claim that preaching should be reserved for men only, while others argue that neither Jesus nor the early Christians excluded women from this role. Let us examine what the Bible teaches us on this subject, as well as the history of the church in this regard. Let us take a closer look at 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34, 35 and 1 Timothy 2 verses 11, 12. I understand the position of those who rely on these verses to state that women should be silent in the gatherings and not teach. However, it is important to put these passages back into their historical and literary context and interpret them in light of the overall biblical message. To begin, these injunctions of Paul were likely aiming to correct certain disorders in the Corinthian and Ephesian gatherings at the time. The women were probably asking disruptive and untimely questions or teaching heretical doctrines. Paul seeks to re-establish good order and submission to the established authority. In addition, these recommendations are part of letters addressed to specific churches, not as universal guidelines. The Apostle himself sometimes shows flexibility on this subject depending on the circumstances. 1 Corinthians 11, 5 His statements should be understood taking into account the patriarchal context of the time, which was very different from ours. Moreover, other biblical passages show that women like Mary, Priscilla and Junia exercised ministries of proclaiming the gospel and teaching. Romans 16, 7 the texts on the universal priesthood of believers and the gifts of the Spirit given to all seem to relativize the restrictions concerning women. We must avoid any narrow fundamentalism or literalism regarding these verses. Interpretation should be done in light of the central biblical message of equality in Christ and diversity of the gifts of the Spirit. An intelligent and open reading makes it possible to articulate circumstantial commands linked to specific situations and more universal biblical principles. This leaves room for women's ministry with respect for authority and order. We who believe that the Bible is the word of God are confronted with a permanent tension in its interpretation. On one hand, we want to take every biblical verse seriously as a divine instruction valid for all times and places. But on the other hand, we realize that some passages are linked to very specific cultural and historical contexts which means we should understand them in context before applying them. How can we find the right balance between these two poles in our reading of the Holy Scriptures? And more broadly, what should our approach to biblical texts be? First of all, let us strongly reaffirm that the Bible is entirely inspired by God from beginning to end. Every book, chapter and verse bears divine authority and contains the truth. Jesus himself proclaims that scripture cannot be broken, John 10.35, and that it is the word of God, Matthew 15.6. The biblical writers themselves speak in the name of God, carried by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1.21. The Bible is not a human book of wisdom, but rather the divine revelation oriented toward salvation in Christ. It is therefore the absolute and supreme norm for the believer's faith and conduct. That being said, we must immediately add that God chose to reveal himself through human words marked by diverse errors and cultures. The biblical authors wrote according to their language, personality and own style, while being guided by the Spirit. God's eternal word thus becomes incarnate in a message adapted to specific audiences, with force, images, metaphors and commandments related to socio-cultural realities. The Bible is both divine and human in its composition. This means on one hand that we must seek the original meaning intended by the biblical author for his first recipients. 
understanding the context, history and culture helps grasp the authentic message. Biblical scholarship provides us with valuable keys. For example, certain Old Testament precepts on slavery, veiling or food laws make more sense when we know the ancient setting. But on the other hand, the significance of the text goes beyond its initial meaning. Because the Holy Spirit intended to convey the word to us through these scriptures, we must identify the revealed principles, the theological meaning of the texts. Thus, behind the rules of food, purity lies the principle of a holy people. Behind the directives on veiling, that of gender distinctions, etc. The immediate literal meaning does not exhaust the divine significance of the text. We must in this way read the Bible with an approach that is both literal and contextual, seeking what the text said to its first readers while being attentive to what it tells us today. It is the Holy Spirit who guides us towards the complete meaning. Sometimes, certain precepts are immediately transposable because they express timeless principles of faith, ethics, relationship with God, example, the Ten Commandments. At other times, we must understand the symbolic, poetic or historically limited scope of certain passages before applying them discerningly. Literary genres are important. The poetry of the Psalms, epic narratives, legal codes and practical exhortations do not have the same purpose. The New Testament often provides the interpretive key to difficult Old Testament texts. In conclusion, our reading of the Bible must combine a profound respect for the divine authority of the text and an intelligent approach that takes into account that it is a revelation in time. Let us avoid two pitfalls. On one hand, a fundamentalism that would mechanically apply every verse without discernment. On the other hand, a relativism that would only retain from the text what suits us over-historicizing things. Let us ask ourselves these questions when facing a complex passage. What is the central message? What is the transcendent scriptural norm? How does the revealed principle apply wisely in our context? The Holy Spirit guides us to understand and live out the word. Let us move forward with humility and confidence on this path of interpretation that makes scripture the lamp that enlightens our steps. Let us recall that preaching is first and foremost the proclamation of the gospel, the announcement of the good news of salvation by grace. Now Jesus Christ commissioned all his disciples, men and women, to be his witnesses and spread the good news. When Mary Magdalene was the first to whom the risen Jesus appeared, he said to her, Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. John 20.17 Mary obeyed and announced to the disciples that Jesus is alive. She is truly the first preacher of the resurrection. Other women were also actively preaching the gospel in the early church, like Priscilla, Acts 18.26, Phoebe, Romans 16.1, or the four daughters of Philip, Acts 21.8.9. Peter quotes the prophet Joel to proclaim that at Pentecost the Spirit is poured out on all flesh and sons and daughters shall prophesy, Acts 2.17.18. The prophet Agabus and Philip's four daughters were recognized for their gift of prophecy. Similarly, at that same Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the gathered church, Peter declares that the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are afar off. Acts 2.39 Men and women receive the Holy Spirit and begin to proclaim the wonders of God. Acts 2.17.18 the Apostle Paul also affirms that in Christ Jesus there is no longer male or female. Galatians 3.28 The essential thing is that all preaching, whether by a man or woman, be done in order and submission to the authority of Scripture. From a theological perspective, Jesus abolished ethnic, cultural and gender distinctions in his person. The gift of the Spirit is granted to every believer, male or female. There is nothing to restrict the gifts of preaching to men alone. On the contrary, the Spirit distributes gifts as He wills, regardless of gender, 1 Cor 12, 11. The history of the Church provides us with many examples of women who exercised fruitful ministries of preaching, teaching and leadership. From the earliest centuries, deaconesses like Phoebe, whom we have already mentioned, Romans 16, 1, played an important role in the early Church. 
Catherine of Siena and Teresa of Avila, doctors of the church wrote and taught extensively in the Middle Ages. During the Reformation in the 16th century, convicted women like Marie Dentier and Olympia Fulvia Morata were fervent preachers of the gospel. More recently, pioneers like Amy Semple McPherson founded large churches and contributed to revivals. Their preaching nourished and edified crowds. Nowadays, more and more Protestant churches recognize the gift of preaching in women and call them to pastoral ministry. Prominent evangelical theologians like Jane Williams, Karen Jobes, and Lucy Pepiot wisely and discerningly defend women's leadership based on scripture. Very often their preaching deeply touches hearts and leads many to faith in Christ. Of course, questions of practical application remain that require discernment and wisdom such as how to articulate women's pastoral ministry with biblical principles of authority and submission. What are appropriate ways in each church context? The essential thing is that women clearly anointed and called by God to proclaim his word not be stifled, but able to use their gifts in service to the body of Christ for the advancement of the kingdom. Indeed, if the Bible affirms the fundamental equality between man and woman in Christ, it also maintains a certain distinction in roles, with man called to exercise servant authority and leadership in the familial and church spheres. How then to articulate male authority and female ministry? For example, should a woman pastor be under the direct oversight of a male pastor in a local church? Can she preach when men are present in the assembly? Can she preside over communion? These are complex questions that require wisdom and discernment. The essential thing is not to disqualify women called to pastoral ministry from the outset, but to seek to integrate their gifts into the church body in an orderly manner under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Their ministry can take various forms according to the contexts. Most importantly, they should be able to use their spiritual gifts in service of Christ for the advancement of His kingdom with respect for biblical principles, but without being locked into stereotypical roles inherited from the past. Ultimately, welcoming the ministry of women in our churches wisely should be done in a spirit of unity, humility, and ongoing discernment. Remembering this word from Paul, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 6. Consequently, there is truly nothing in scripture that prevents women from proclaiming the gospel in Christian gatherings alongside men. On the contrary, the testimony of church history and Jesus' own example encourage it. It is the Holy Spirit who distributes his gifts as he wills. Every baptized person, male or female, is called to use their abilities for the common good and the growth of the body of Christ. As the Apostle Peter declares, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. 1 Peter 4, 10, 11. May we encourage all gifts of preaching that God distributes for the edification of his church. Let us meditate on these words from the Apostle Peter, which apply equally to women and men. To you it was revealed, not to mere men, but to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, called to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 1 12, 2, 9. May our greatest desire be to make Jesus Christ known through our words and our entire life.